Okay, so we're going to start about canon of the Bible. I'm going to do something a little different today. So in discipleship class number 14, what I'm going to do is I am going to do one lesson at a time. Because I notice that with people, it, when I combine three subjects, it's just too fast. And some people may have fallen behind on the audio homework, and they did not catch up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one lesson at a time. And then I'm going to try to figure out what I could do to speed up the process as well so that you people can get down to other subjects as well. But anyway, the, these basic doctrines, it's important that you fully understand them. So this stuff will be very good for you to learn anyway. You're still going to grow. All right, so the canon of the Bible. So meaning what? What do we mean by canon of the Bible? Which books of the Bible are right? So that's the idea. So when we talk about biblical canon or canon of the Bible, the idea is which books of the Bible are right. Okay, so I gave you some notes. Unfortunately, people online, I can't give it to you. Sorry about that. Only the people here. But with the people here, feel free to add further notes or whatever notes you want to write on this. So this is all yours, this paper. So do whatever you want with these notes. Okay. So the idea is this, how do we know which books in the Bible are right and which ones are wrong? The first rule is that when God approves the book, that's the first rule. Which books did God approve? If we find out which books that God approved, then we know which books are right. Now, there are th three sub-points to realize from this. The first thing is that what did Jesus believe? What did Jesus approve to be the right books of the Bible, right? And what you're going to find out is that he called Isaiah the scriptures. That's found in Luke chapter 4, verse 17 through 21. He also called Jonah and Daniel as prophet at Matthew 12, 39 and chapter 24, verse 15. He also quoted Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Zechariah as authoritative sources. That's found in Matthew 4, 1 through 10. John chapter 8, verse 17, and Mark chapter 14, verse 27. So Jesus Christ, he used these books. That's why we know which books in the Bible are right. Not only did he use these books, Jesus himself laid out pretty much the whole canon for you. So this is the most important point. He laid out the Old Testament canon, as well as the New Testament canon. You might say, how so? Well, this is how it works. First of all, what he did was that he mentioned in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. So these are important verses to write down. So we're going to look at them briefly as well. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. These are the two most famous verses that you should mark down. These will be extremely helpful concerning biblical canon. The second one is Matthew 23. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 24, verse 44, and then we're going to look at Matthew chapter 23. So in Matthew chapter 23, he lays out the entire books of the Old Testament. It's going to be Matthew 23, 35. Matthew 23, 35. So that's not written in your notes, as you may have noticed. So you might want to add that in your notes. And then the other one is Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Okay, so let's read these two passages right here. Luke 24, 44. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written. Okay, so he's going to point out which parts is legitimate books in the Bible here. What are they? The law of Moses, that's one. The second one, the prophets, two, and in the Psalms, three. Those are the three layouts. And if you were to look at Josephus, and he's not a Christian historian, Josephus from the first century, first century recorded that the five books of Moses were known as the Law of Moses. And then Joshua all the way to the book of Daniel and the 12 minor prophets are known as the prophets. And then the Psalms are known from Song of Solomon and then the Psalms as, uh, from Psalms to Song of Solomon, excuse me, from the books of Psalms to Song of Solomon. So we see right here the whole Old Testament books laid out. Matthew 23, 
And then you'll look at verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. See, Genesis right here, because Jesus was telling the Pharisees, these people warned you what God said, thus showing you what's legitimate scripture. The blood of Abel, that's Genesis, unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachias. That's Second Chronicles. Now, the reason why Jesus Christ told them the prophets in this order from beginning to end, Abel to Zacharias, is because the Hebrew Old Testament layout is from Genesis to 2 Chronicles. Now, in our King James Bible, we have it from Genesis to Malachi. Here's the thing. The Hebrew Old Testament has all the same books, but it puts it in a different order, okay? Instead, it will put 2 Chronicles at the end, but it will have all the same books as your King James Bible, the Masoretic Hebrew. So we see right here in Matthew chapter 23, verse 35, we got the whole Old Testament canon. These are the two most famous passages on Old Testament canon that you should remember. They're going to be very helpful. The other one is the New Testament now. How do we know that Jesus Christ approved of the New Testament now? The New Testament, they will be found in John 14, verse 26. As uh, The book of John is the key. And then chapter 16, verse 13. If you look at these two passages, Jesus said that the words of God would be passed on upon his disciples. Thus you know that the books in your New Testament that you have, which were written by the disciples, they are legitimate. Not only that, the Apostle Peter, now this one is extremely helpful because a lot of people hate the Apostle Paul. In 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16, Peter, who's the chief Christian leader, okay, the chief Christian leader of the church, referred to Paul's writings as scripture. So this proves right here we got the New, all the New Testament books of the Bible covered. So why do we know that these books are the right books in the Bible? Because of what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said. He's the authority. Okay, the other one is evidences. Evidences that support the book. Evidences. So we see right here, uh, just let me know if I'm off camera. Am I off camera if I do it right here? Uh, no, you're, you're by okay then, so we're going to look at the evidences right here. The evidences of the Bible that are supported right here. So the evidences that support the book, you're going to find out, they are going to be uh, several sources, several sources. One of them is actually the ancient Dead Sea Scrolls. It contains all the Old Testament books that your King James Bible has, except the book of Esther. Now, they might have some other things that our King James Bible do not have, but it doesn't change the fact that there's an ancient source that at least has all the books that you have in your Old Testament. So there is legitimate ancient sources. So here... The evidences we see are the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's one, Dead Sea Scrolls. And then the other source that we have is also, now these verses are really important. So one, Dead Sea Scrolls. And then the second thing is we have uh, the Bible itself. Look at Deuteronomy 32. We're not going to turn over there for time's sake, but I'm going to write these verses out. Verses 25 through 26, as well as Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. In these two books, these two passages, it shows that the Jews were in charge of the Old Testament scriptures. You're going to find out. That's from the beginning of Moses all the way to the end of the Babylonian captivity. That's the whole entire Old Testament era there. So these two passages show that the Jews are the ones who have the Old Testament books of the Bible right. And even the Apostle Paul agreed in Romans chapter 3, verse 2. He says the oracles of God, see, God's words were given to the Jews at Romans chapter 3, verse 2. So if you look at the Hebrew Masoretic text, they were written by the Jews, known as the Masoretes, and they have all the same books as our King James Bible. How do we know that the Masoretic text, so the King James Bible was translated from the Masoretic text. How do we know that this is right? Well, because God told you the Jews. The Jews have the word of God. 
So thus we know that that's right. Another evidence is from a Harvard scholar. I recommend his book. His name is Dr. Edward F. Hills. Dr. Edward F. Hills. In his book, it's called Believing Bible Study. So you'll see that in your paper right there. So it has all the documentations there. For the people who don't have it online, you can write this down. Believing Bible Study, pages 5 through 9. Believing Bible Study, pages 5 through 9. That's by Dr. Edward F. Hills. He, this is a scholar from Yale and Harvard. He gives historical explanations that all the books in our King James Bible... I mean, all of it, Old Testament, New Testament. They are given by inspiration of God, while the non-canonical books, such as the Apocrypha and other pseudepigraphal writings, are corrupt. And this is supported by scholars, scholastic sources. So we do have evidence. This is not just out of thin air. We have scholastic sources. Not only that, this one is really important. Now, this book is written by... Dr. Lee Martin McDonald. It's called the Biblical Canon. It's called the Biblical Canon. But in right here, majority of early churches agreed with Athanasius. He's an early church Christian leader during that time, an early church leader. But majority of early churches, they agreed with Athanasius that all the books that you have in your King James Bible, I mean, in that direct order, should be officially recognized as the Bible. They did not accept the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha. This is supported by Dr. Lee Martin McDonald's book, The Biblical Canon, page 381, Dr. Edward F. Hill's Believing Bible Study, pages 5 through 9. And think about it. If you want to find the right books in your Bible, who should you go to? The early Christians. So these were early Christians during that time. Majority of them, majority of them agreed that these books with Athanasius were the correct books. And the early Christians had the words of God. This is evidenced by the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 49. They had, they had the words of God, the Bible said, as well as Colossians 3, 16. So the early Christians had the words of God. Another evidence, so we have number five here. Number five, a list of New Testament scriptures dating to the latter half of the second century was discovered in the Ambrosian Library in Milan, Italy at 1740. This second century, see it's a second century list, that's really ancient, contains all of the 27 books of the New Testament canon. Amen. Now, this is supported by John Hens's book, page 60, at History of the Lutheran Version. Okay, now that we covered right here, one, God approves a book. Two, it's supported by evidences. And subpoint one, two, three, four, five, these are the evidences. Now, the other evidence, this one is really important. Three and four are extremely important. The long-lasting availability of the book. The long-lasting availability of the book. So how do we know that we have the right books in our Bible? It's because of God's promise that, <coughs> that his words would be available. Okay, now think about it. Book of Enoch, that's considered lost book, right? Think about it. Uh, what about the Gospel of Thomas? Lost Gospel, right? Those are known as the Lost Gospel. Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Lost Gospel. Epistle of Barnabas, etc., etc., etc. For centuries, you got to understand, lost books. They're known as the lost books. So if these are known as the lost books, are they the words of God? No, because God said his books, his words would not be lost. They would be long-lasting and available. So that's found at Isaiah chapter 55. So we will turn over there. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. The second passage is Psalms 12, 6 through 7, but we won't turn there for time's sake. We're going to look at Isaiah 55, 11. The other passage, though, is Psalms 12, 6 through 7. These two passages prove uh, that based on number three of the evidence why we have the right books of the Bible is the long-lasting availability of the book. That's why we know that the other books in the Bible that, they, that people consider, especially online, it's really all over. They want to mention this lost gospel, this lost book of the Bible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the thing is this, is that those are lost books, and God says that his words would not be lost. 
It's going to be available throughout the generations. So the long-lasting availability, available for people to read. Those are found at Isaiah 55, 11, and Psalms 12, 6 through 7. So Psalms 12, 6 through 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, the words, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve, preserve, keep them safe. Preserve them from this generation. See that? Currently in their generation, forever. So the words aren't lost. They're not hiding somewhere down in a cave or underground, etc. They're available for generations to read. Okay, so Isaiah 55, 11, what does it say? It, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me, what? Void. See, it's not going to be lost. It's not going to be lost and gone. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. See, it prospers. It doesn't make sense that the book of Enoch or other gospels, they don't prosper for centuries until what? Until all of a sudden YouTube comes out and then these videos come out? doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. Not only that, what did Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, 35? Jesus himself even said that. Jesus himself, himself said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, what? Shall not pass away. So, uh, get rid of those other gospels, you got to understand, those other books. The Lord doesn't consider them to be his words at that time. Now, another thing is the blessing of God upon the book, the blessing. So that's the fourth reason why we know we got the right books in the Bible. Revelation chapter 21, verse 18 through 19. So numbers 3 and 4 are the most powerful reasons you know you got the right books in the Bible. It's th these two cases here. But let's turn to Revelation 21, 18 through 19. Now, in this passage, God clearly said, uh, it should be chapter 22, actually. So... Chapter 22, so that, that is an error. That is an error. That's a typographical error in your King James Bible right there. I'm just kidding. All right, Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 through 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall what? Add unto these things. God shall add unto him the plagues are written in the book. So if you have any books in your Bible right now that are added, then what did God say? He's going to plague it. Here's verse 19, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. If the book of Enoch was really taken out of the Bible, the gospel of Thomas, the epistle of Barnabas was really taken out of the Bible as legit sources, God said he would curse it, not bless it. It doesn't make sense when you look at the dark ages, the dark ages where the Catholic Church was burning Bibles, why is it that the Lord was putting his hand a blessing in preserving thousands of manuscripts with the Bible? Why is it that God would bless England with great prosperity during Queen Victoria's reign when she handed the Bible that had all the books of the King James Bible and said, this is the secret to England's greatness? Why is it that America started out with its success based on the King James Bible? I know that Throughout uh, this time period, we got the elites who followed in the tales and the Catholic Church who followed in the tales. But you got to realize this. Behind the blessing of God, Satan will always trail behind it to do whatever he can to corrupt it. So the evidence of God's blessing upon the book cannot be denied. And the corruption attacks following behind the blessings prove even more we got the right books in our Bible. Amen. Okay, so... Number five, okay, this one is my favorite part. It's not the strongest evidence, but it's my favorite. You know why? Because it's really hilarious, some of these other books in the Bible, or so-called Bible. So how do we know we got the right books in the Bible? Because it doesn't contain the errors as the Apocrypha does, as the other pseudepigraphal books and the Book of Enoch. It doesn't contain those uh, errors. First of all, uh, witchcraft, witchcraft. So, obviously, we do know <laughs> that uh, our Bible does not condone witchcraft. And you'll see that right here. 
in the apocryphal book. Chapter 6, verse 5 through 7. Uh, Tobit. Then the angel said to him, Take out the entrails of this fish and lay up his heart and his gall and his liver for thee. For these are necessary for useful medicines. And when he had done so, he roasted the flesh thereof, and they took it with them in the way. The rest they salted as much as might serve them, till they came to, till they came to Rages, the city of the Medes. Then Tobias asked the angel and said to him, I beseech thee, brother Azarias, tell me what remedies are these things good for, which thou hast bid me keep of the fish. And the angel answering said to him, If thou put a little piece of its heart upon coals, the smoke thereof driveth away all kinds of devils, either from man or from woman, so that they come no more to them. Now, doesn't that sound like witchcraft? <laughs> yes, all right, so we know that the Apocrypha is big, no, no. Here's another one, Tobit chapter 12, verse 9. Alms cleanses all sins. What, what, that, no wonder the Catholic Church, no wonder the Catholic Church wants to keep the Apocrypha, right? That makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense, yeah. I'm sure you don't want to follow the Catholic Church now. So, you don't want the Apocrypha, trust me. Tobit chapter 12, verse 9 is another error. Alms cleanses all sins. Quote, for alms delivereth from death, and the same is that which purgeth away sins and maketh to find mercy and life everlasting. That contradicts 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sins. Here's another one. Baruch chapter 6 and then verse 2. There's a contradiction here with this one and Jeremiah. It says that Babylon captivity would last for seven generations. Quote, and when you are coming to Babylon, you shall be there many years and for a long time, even to seven generations. Why, the Bible says in Jeremiah 29.10, it's 70 years. Okay, that's not, even, that's not even two generations right there, for crying out loud. Another one, now this is hilarious, is 2 Maccabees. 2 Maccabees. Now, if you want to have Apocrypha in your library just for a good laugh, then I encourage you to buy one. But to keep it as the word of God and you bring it to Sunday church, you just embarrass yourself. Amen. 2 Maccabees 9, 5 through 6, verse 18. Now, this sounds like Java the Hutt and the, the witch at the Wizard of Oz just melting or something, okay? Quote, But the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, smote him with an incurable and invisible plague, where as soon as he had spoken these words, a pain of the bowels that was remediless came upon him and sore torments of the inner parts, and that most justly, for he had tormented other men's bowels with many and strange torments, so that the worms rose out of the body of this wicked man, and while he lived in sorrow and, sorrow and pain, his flesh fell away, and the filthiness of his smell was noisome to all his army. But for all this, his pains would not cease, for the just judgment of God was come upon him. Therefore, despairing of his health. Now, you've got to realize he's melting away. While he's screaming, I'm melting, he's writing a letter at the same time. <laughs> he wrote unto the Jews the letter underwritten, containing the form of a supplication after this manner. And it quotes all this thing in a long letter. How is it possible that Antiochus's body was rotting away, tormented by an incurable plague, being eaten up by worms where it's coming out of his body while writing a letter to the Jews? <laughs> Here's a wrong calculation of years and date. Tobit 1, 3 through 5, as well as chapter 14, verse 11. There's a contradiction right here. What's the contradiction? I, Tobit, have walked all the days of my life in the way of truth and justice, and I did many alms deeds to my brethren and my nation who came with me to Nineveh and to the land of the Assyrians. And while I was in mine own country in the land of Israel, being but young, all the tribe of Naphtali, my father, fell from the house of Jerusalem. Okay, now I'm going to have to uh, uh, s s pause reading here. So you guys are just going to have to look it up for time's sake. But basically in these passages... Tobit claimed to have been alive when Israel revolted, which is 931 B.C. And when Israel conquered, uh, excuse me, when Assyria conquered Israel, which is 722 B.C. Now, if you look at those two timelines then, those two events were separated by over 200 years. 
And yet the total lifespan of Tobit, according to those verses that you're going to look at, is only 185 years. So let alone this is quite a stretch, 200 years, that he lived to see these two events. It even contradicted their own verse where Tobit lived for 185 years. So this is totally off. Another one is suicide. Now, I don't think you'd condone a book that praises suicide. Second Maccabees. Now, this is hilarious. This one I have to read. I don't care if we don't have time. I have to read this. This is just so funny. This is just so funny. All right. The soldiers were about to capture the tower where, where Rhesus had gone. They were forcing open the gates to the courtyard, and the order had been given to set the door on fire. Rhesus realized there was no escape, so he tried to commit suicide with his sword, preferring to die with honor rather than suffer humiliation at the hands of evil men. Under the pressure of the moment, Rhesus misjudged the thrust of the sword, and it did not kill him. So while the soldiers were swarming into the room, he rushed to the wall. So you got to realize this. Now he stabbed the sword on him, and then he's got the sword dangling on him while he's rushing to the wall. He rushed to the wall. He climbed up at this big city wall. And you know what the verse says when he, jumped, when he went to this wall, the city wall? And jumped off like a brave hero into the crowd below. What in the world, man? <laughs> man, he thinks he's Tarzan or something, you know? <laughs> He's probably screaming, freedom, when he jumps off. But anyway, right here, he keeps reading right here. The crowd, this is hilarious. The crowd, so he's falling. The crowd quickly moved back, and he fell into the space they left. <laughs> it's like a cartoon, man. Still alive. He's still alive. That's what the verse says. <laughs> still alive and burning with courage. Burning with courage? What? He got up, and with blood gushing from his wounds, he ran through the crowd and finally climbed a steep rock, now completely drained of blood. He tore out his intestines with both hands and threw them at the crowd, and he did so. He prayed for the Lord of life and breath to give them back to him. That was how he died, period. Please, none of you die that way. <laughs> that would be so humiliating right there. Okay. So, number six, there is no foolproof argument against the book that we have. There is no foolproof argument. So, let's go through this real briefly, and then we'll call it a night. Your notes would give you all the information that you need. The first argument from Bible critics will say, there are different early churches and Christians who claim some apocryphal and pseudepigraphal writings as scripture. When they do that, all you have to do is simply tell them, okay, give me a book. Give me an example and proof. Then they'll name you a book. Once they name you a book, then you tell them this. Well, even if they did, those writings contradicted at least, what? One of the five points that we looked through. See? So it doesn't matter. It will contradict one of those five points. So those writings cannot be scripture. Here's a second argument from them. There were some early churches and Christians who did not approve some of the books that you have right now in the King James Bible as the Word of God. For example, the Dead Sea Scrolls skipped the book of Esther, and they might, give another, uh, they might give more. You do the same thing again. Okay, give me an example. You challenge them to give you an example again, or name a book. When he names the book, you tell them this. Even if they did, the majority of early churches, right? The majority, we looked at point number two. The majority of early churches as well as a majority of Christians and even evidences approved all of the books in the King James Bible as the word of God. So you look at point number two on that one. So we just don't look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and say, oh, we got evidence. No, we look at all the evidences, not just one, see? Remember that men cannot be dependable as a final authority. And then remember that points one through five clearly prove that the books in our King James Bible are the word of God. We went through all the five points. Here's a famous argument. The Catholic Church is the one who gave us the Bible. You heard that? They're going to say the Catholic Church was also the one responsible for hiding the book of Enoch and all these gospels. And they're going to bring out the Council of Nicaea at 325 A.D. Uh, and Catholics, they're going to use that argument as, so the final authority should be the Catholic Church then. <laughs> Because we chose the books in the Bible for you, not you guys. 
Okay, now, it is true that a Catholic council gave us the books, but this actually proves that the Christians were not being biased and picked whatever book that they want to fit their beliefs. The Catholic Church is not the final authority because they contradict the books that they chose for your Bible. <laughs> See, duh, right there. Well, they sure didn't do a good job, didn't they? And not only that, there are evidences that the books in the King James Bible, points one through two, right? Jesus himself. And the other evidences that we looked at at point number two. Before the Catholic Church already showed you which books of the Bible were right. So it doesn't change that. Okay, thus we close our study on the canon of the Bible. Heavenly Father, dismiss us now with your blessing. I pray tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers and help us to grow in knowledge of in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.